happened in the 31 years I've been practicing this field is nothing more than an economic revolution. What I'm talking about is innovation, not science. And innovation is not possible without the basic science being there. And the rigor is applied to the science. I would argue that if all you do is science, you're not going to have innovation. So the title of this talk is Can Disruptive, that's a big word, Entrepreneurial Innovation, that's also a big concept, be systematic? I'd like to propose that the single biggest innovation that has created value for society is actually none of these, but it is the startup venture. After spending a decade involved in starting companies with different teams in different ways, the thing that, is, that got me interested is this question, can you institutionalize entrepreneurial innovation? So just to, take, just to make this a little more personal, I'll take you back. So in 1987, when, when I got a PhD in MIT in what was then a new field, biological engineering, biochemical engineering, the choices I had, which is different than the choice many of you in the audience as graduates today have, was the most likely thing to do would have been to go into academia. This was a new field, people needed professors. The next likely thing was to join a large company, either in the pharmaceutical industry, chemical industry. And then there were a few mid-sized, mid to small companies. And, and I ended up 31 years ago, which was not at all the common practice, uh, and I kind of attribute this to ignorance being bliss, starting up a company. Now, I'll tell you right up front, there's nothing rational about starting companies. Probability adjusted, it is probably going to be value destroying. And the notion that we do it is a tribute to our willingness to be optimistic and to take leaps of faith. So the, for the first decade, I was involved in starting some companies that some of them merged with other ones, some of them were spun out, and then there were some independent ones. And, and the reason I'm telling, showing you this is not the detail, let me just skip ahead, that it, throughout the 90s, I ended up experimenting with a, a number of different the companies, mostly in the life science area. One of them, kind of oddly enough, was in the solid state lighting business. It was the first LED lighting company uh, uh, started in the world, this color kinetics and all the initial IP on lights that were made out of uh, uh, LEDs back in 1998. In the field of emergent processes, one of the things that we know a lot about is Darwinian evolution. The simple notion that if you do systematically variation, selection, and iteration, you get novelty. Now you get novelty that is selected for its competitive advantage in the particular time and point at which that competition was happening, but you get novelty. And it's emergent novelty because it's highly unexpected solutions to problems. That's what nature shows us. Well, that's kind of what innovation should be. Innovation is a search for unexpected solutions to problems in a competitive situation that isn't simply the linear combination of all the things that you could have varied, but in fact creates advantage. After spending a decade involved in starting companies with different teams in different ways, the thing that, is, that got me interested is this question, can you institutionalize entrepreneurial innovation? Failure is a necessary rampant component of an emergent process. In fact, if you take all the failures away, you cannot have advances. And yet people, society, absolutely frowns upon failure, frowns upon experiments that don't work out, etc. And there's nothing efficient about evolution, I would argue. There is something successful about evolution, but there isn't anything efficient. There's a lot, a lot of wasteful kind of things. The mindset of an immigrant is essential to innovation. So just think about it for a second. What does an immigrant do when they go into a new country? They, first of all, get rid of all their pretense and all their expectations that something is owed to them. There's no immigrant receive, receiving country that owes the immigrant anything. And so, but that's okay, because they accept that for granted. They have no entitlement. They usually don't know the language, they don't know the culture, they doubt everything, they're worried about people kind of taking advantage of them. And that mindset of poised, making sure that you're surviving is a huge parallel to innovation. I would argue emphatically that innovation is just intellectual immigration. Much of breakthrough innovation starts being, by being unreasonable. Reasonableness does not allow us to escape what is currently possible. Now, I'm sure this is not 100% true. There's probably a bunch of things that are worth doing that start reasonable. But on average, I'd, I'd rather you not discount things because they seem unreasonable. 
And furthermore, making something unreasonable seem reasonable is a really bad idea. Because what it does is that people who think they're investing in you think they're investing in something that's otherwise reasonable. And since you already know it's not, eventually they're going to find out just what kind of a risk they took. As an entrepreneur, never do that. Instead, try to convince people that it's okay to start with something unreasonable if you can describe a set of steps that might earn the, your way to making it reasonable. And that's kind of what the development process of innovation is that I'll describe to you. With Ruben, Pierre, Ardash Jesus here, Kazakhetsi and others, back about 18, 17, 18 years ago and many others, we worked on, uh, Andre I think is here too, Andre Magritte, we worked on thinking about what could Armenia become. And we had a dilemma. All the experts kept telling us to focus on the current problems and offer solutions. Otherwise we would be irrelevant. And we thought, well, if you keep working on the current problems, you'll never make systemic change. You'll just make a slightly better tomorrow. And that's true that over time, slightly better tomorrows might become really, really better day after tomorrows. More likely, it's going to be pretty damn close to today. So instead, we thought, well, why don't we first think about what could Armenia become? So if you can suspend gravity for a second, gravity in this case is dogma. By the way, you might be thinking, boy, I spent all my life becoming an expert, and if that is getting in the way of innovation, what am I doing? And, and I'd say it's worth thinking about. Experts hardly ever, in my experience, make major breakthroughs. They be, are called experts after they make major breakthroughs. They're not experts before they make major breakthroughs because once they become experts, they fill their time thinking about all the things that can't be done and all the things that can be done that are proximal that will double down on their expertise. I, I really mean this very honestly. Uh, uh, this is what we run into. So the idea I would put forward for you is, can you foresee something that might be valuable? Foretell is an important thing. If you can't communicate it to other people, you're not going to get any communal thinking about, is this actually valuable? Can you actually think about ways to get there? And then can you set out to reach that place sooner than other people can? This is kind of the general idea. So why do we expect unreasonably large rewards from major, major advances? from reasonable people doing reasonable things. The entirety of the granting system in the world is experts looking for reasonable ideas by reasonable people. Say, this approach you could think about as roots firmly planted in the future, but operating in the present. And that's a very uncomfortable feeling, by the way, because people will make fun of you. People will constantly say, how do you know it's going to work? And you have no answer to that because you don't know it's going to work except you can point to lots of other things that nobody knew could work that came from the same place. So if you ask them back, how, do you, how did they know that it was going to work? The answer is they didn't either. If you say anything about the future, you are chased out of university because it's not scholarly. People basically consider you a fraud. It's true. And in fact, science fiction is a you know, frowned upon part of literature. I don't think there's, the, I don't know, maybe you can correct me if there's Nobel Prizes given on science fiction as literature. It's not considered serious. Isn't it ironic that we expect innovation and completely surprising new capabilities, artificial intelligence, you know, data science, human-machine hybrids, and yet anybody that dare says anything about that is considered unserious, chased out of academia. You go to a scientific meeting and talk about something you think 10 years from now precisely can be done with no proof. But they won't give you a podium. In fact, I'm surprised they gave me a podium. After spending a decade involved in starting companies with different teams in different ways. The thing that, is, that got me interested is this question. Can you institutionalize entrepreneurial innovation? The way we operate, using this as a guiding principle, in my firm is this. We are about 400 people, about 100 of them being PhDs and MDs, who literally all day long think initially about completely unreasonable hypotheses for value, mostly in the healthcare and agriculture nutrition fields. We don't work a lot in the IT sector. A lot of data in what we do, but we don't just work on innovation of IT. And each of these explorations, what we call explorations, starts out as a value hypothesis. It combines a scientific hypothesis, no proof, a product hypothesis, no reality, a value hypothesis, no way to prove it, and a way to protect it. The protection is not such a bad thing because you're working in a brand new area, patents will be available. Everything else is completely crazy. Now, the reason we do this is that before we go into labs, which is this phase, we spend a month, two months, talking to anybody who will talk to us about these unreasonable hypotheses. Turns out, one little secret I'll tell you, 
that if you talk to people about your crazy idea, they happily tell you how crazy it is. And in fact, they'll even tell you what's crazy about it. And there are people, and by the way, in Armenia too, love telling you how stupid your idea is. Most people get offended by that. They get depressed, they get belittled. If you just say thank you very much and then take what they said and iterate so that in an evolutionary way, the next person you talk to has your original idea now evolved with the critical feedback, 20, 30 people later, try it if you want, 20, 30 people later, sometimes 50, sometimes 100, but not two or three, you end up with a descendant of the original hypothesis that nobody can tell you what's wrong with it, but for the fact that it's completely made up. Then and only then do we go into labs and we don't do research. In fact, I think the whole notion of research is this hopeless search for new things. We basically do experiments to either kill or propel the idea forward. So we do the proverbial killer experiments. Right? We're not doing research. We're doing reduction to practice. If we can, remember going future backwards, if we can show that some of the underlying scientific assertions can be demonstrated in a short time, one year, short amount of money, a million dollars, we go ahead. Well, it's if we can't, money. either because turns out what we had said was completely unprovable, or it would have taken 10 years, you know, nuclear fusion, or 50 years, whatever, we just won't work on it. See, it turns out as an innovator, you don't have to work on a particular thing, you just have to work on something that creates value. And so we're not that worried about which one of these makes it through. We're very systematic here. So this is kind of the killing field, what we call a prototype company, of these explorations. If you get through this phase, value discovery, and this phase, reduction to practice, then and only then do we launch a company. And through that methodology, we've been involved in some 75 of these. These are the ones that exist today. And roughly six to eight of these new projects every year end up becoming, entering this new core phase and go on. And that's how we work. You have a mail message. The reason in our model we can at least try to do this is that the capital, the teams, and the science are developed in one entity. There's only one enterprise, and we're not relying on external components except if we want to license in something or get people to co-invest down, downstream. We do better when we hire people right out of graduate school or medical school than we do hiring them with 10, 20 years of experience because it's really hard to undo the experience. Really, really hard. If you've gotten job promotions, titles, your resume is filled with a bunch of reasonable things you did, it's kind of hard to then, you know, that would be like me pretending I'm going to do ballet in front of you. Expertise. Yeah. I know I took some knocks at experts. Again, I took some knocks at experts as it relates to innovation, not as it relates to science. You need the scientific expertise in the areas in which you choose to innovate. On an annual basis, we do about 100 of these explorations. So 100 different times a year, we pick a completely uncharted area. I, I've li recently learned in English the meaning of the word far-fetched. Everything we do is li literally far-fetched, that is fetched from afar. The mindset of people who not only do the first place well, but do the whole journey well, are what I would call paranoid optimists, right? This duality of optimism, on the one hand, which allows you to take leaps of faith that, that reason tells you not to take, which all startups basically, all startups worth doing are definitely, un you know, require optimism. And then paranoia, and what I mean by paranoia is, recognizing that you made a lot of assumptions that are likely not true, and that at the first sign of data that says they're not true, to adapt. And in, our, in Armenia, the more connected the local innovation ecosystem gets to the world, and that's going to happen primarily through the diaspora, not exclusively, but primarily, and, and many of you, you, Al, others who are, who are practicing here, uh, are extremely important to that. Uh, that levels the playing field somewhat, as we saw in India, as we've seen in Israel, as we've seen in China. I mean, without those things, it's absolutely not possible because you've got to ultimately get to the market.